Safety Design Awards in the first four years of operation. These include Progressive Architecture Awards, the Award for Emerging Architecture and Future Project Award for Architecture Review, the Wright Award of Excellence, and the Canadian Architect Awards for Design Excellence for three consecutive years. The first work is also featured in the 2011 Design Vanguard issue of Architectural Record. This spring, together with Jae Soon Chon, 5468796 was selected to represent Canada at the Venice Biennale in Architecture in 2012. In addition to practice, both Joanna and Sasha teach design at the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba and have served on several committees and boards with the main goal of promoting the value of architecture to the public. These include the Winnipeg Urban Design Advisory Committee, the Manitoba on the Boards Committee, and the Winnipeg Exchange Bids Board. In 2010, Joanna received a Manitoba Woman Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Emerging Business. And now, with any further ado, please join me and welcome our guest speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, that generous introduction, and thank you so much for having us here. This is. As you can imagine, extremely exciting for us um, to be um, to be doing a lecture at the uh, the National Gallery. Um. Yeah, um, we're just going to try to uh, get through this together, but um, uh, we were mentioning before that uh, it was a last minute edition that Sasha was actually joining me and our travel plans permitted that, um, but it actually I'm really happy about it um, in a way that it actually is much more descriptive the way that we work in the office. And um, this, is, this is our table actually at uh, 546, um, which is uh, our frame for short, also known as barcode, also known as as uh, a numbered company the numbered company that's right and uh, we, what, what we do is we tend to work as a group and we try to be as lateral as we can uh, with the way that the ideas get exchanged and 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 for of course for we always get asked what was the what was the decision to to make this uh, number the name of the firm and for us it's really important not only because our last names are impossible to pronounce but also so that uh, our group can get behind the name 100 percent so they're not working for us they're working with us we actually don't get asked we get heckled to change it by by, by clients at all times because they can't remember it yeah um, and we've been told more than once that it's the stupidest business decision you could have ever made. But um, of course, people are talking about it, so that's the good thing. As long as they're talking, right? Yeah. Um, so we're here to represent really these 12 people that you see uh, see up there, and um, we want to make sure that um, that you understand that as that our work is not only our our ideas and our our contribution, but it really is this this great group that uh, we've we've gathered together. All happen to be human grads, but I don't know how. Whether that oh, has any relevance. It's good or bad, they're all human rights, yeah. So I come, come from Winnipeg. Uh, most of you know where it is. It's in the middle of nowhere. And the, um, and the, um, we just had a conversation today with uh, with um, with several colleagues uh, about something that that's probably happening in Winnipeg these days. We're not sure what it is. Uh, there's a lot of architecture firms coming out from Winnipeg, and um, these days, and the. Um, <coughs> There's been, uh, as a matter of fact, 10 uh, startups in the last four years, uh, while uh, for, for the previous 20 years there's only been one. So it was a, a very interesting, uh, something is happening. I think it, it's partially happening because of the beige nature of the city. As you can see, it's, um, the, 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 the architecture of Winnipeg, if you wish, aside from trees, um, is, is, is fairly, um, fairly beige. And the, uh, there's been the, the entire reactionary movement, if you wish, but there, there was a reaction to, 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 try to try to change things or shake things up. So um, there's, um, there's quite a few firms now that are trying to do that and then doing it quite uh, powerfully, I think. But I think the message here is that uh, us coming from an outside perspective to Winnipeg, you at some point want to really embrace the fact that you are 
in the city and as frozen as it might be at times, um, that there's something that it, it's really possible to do whatever you wish to do in architecture, we believe, uh, from anywhere in the world. So whether it be the backwaters of, of um, I don't know, some small city anywhere in the world, um, Winnipeg is, is a place where, where great things can emerge from as long as you believe that your context uh, is worth uh, tackling and you take that um, at heart as an architect. Mm -hmm. Johanna and I pretty much decided to do uh, to commit to Winnipeg while we were at school, still uh, while we were doing some architectural competitions, had limited success and said, well, it really doesn't matter where we live here or London or, or New York or, or Hong Kong, let's just try to do um, whatever we can from here. So once we started our firm, uh, it actually exploded on us and the... Um, we're still coping with that. The, uh, we, we were hoping, or we were thinking we are going to be doing a lot of kitchen renovations and basement um, renovations and rec rooms. And the, um, what happened is that uh, in a third week, and this is to no, um, we had no idea how this has happened, is a, in a third week we, we had to hire our first um, colleague and then it basically grew from there within the first year we were up to 10 so just to respond to the demand that uh, we received uh, I'm not sure where, we still not, don't know where it's coming from but it happened I think it's because you're so bloody charming all right he is so we're going to introduce you a couple of our projects and hopefully through the introduction of those projects we're we'll able to to convey I guess what we're what we are attempting to do and, and build towards that and in the end we'll talk a little bit about the Biennale project itself. I think the, the, the only thing we can speak about uh, um, an agenda and it's, it's very hard to, to figure out what those agendas are uh, is, is that uh, we've tried to do a few different things and that's really as far as we've gotten in, in, in thinking about or defining the philosophy, we, we actually completely failed at that. So we're just going to go through projects and show you what we've done in the past. You're a bit of a downer, you know? Yeah. Okay, so the first project that uh, we'll show you is called the U-Cube, and, and I think that uh, this is one of the early attempts to, um, or one of our earlier projects, um, to try to reconfigure um, a small condominium project in a fringe area just uh, just sort of on the west or on the east side of downtown Winnipeg. There has been in the recent years, um, I know the maps aren't very legible, but there has been a development uh, trend along the river, along the Red River that cuts through Winnipeg. Uh, on this side here. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in any case, uh, the trend has been such that um, that new condos have been popping up, and, and in Winnipeg, it took a long time for the condo boom in, really even to catch um, up to the rest of the country. But once those condos started to, to emerge on the on the banks of the Red River, they went for a really really high price, and um, in Winnipeg, that's somewhere around four or five hundred thousand um, dollars for sort of let's say a thousand foot um, foot condo. And, and for us, that was at the point where it was very hard uh, for any when uh, not very well established or otherwise fortunate to, to get access to condominium living. And the client who came to us for this particular project for, um, for about 18 condos wanted to change that trend. And he had one lot uh, that you see there on the middle slide uh, that was 263 feet long and 64 feet deep. And he wanted to figure out a way to, um, um, to build uh, from his background, which was in custom house building. And how to make it affordable. Yes, the, the last picture actually shows the overpass, and that's where the red light district starts. So. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Most yeah, he always aspect. wants to mention the red light. That's right. So it's actually, the project's quite interesting between the um, sort of completely gentrified, if you wish, area of the um, high-end condos and the red light district. Uh, this, this, this client decided that he can actually build condos and make some money off of it. Yeah, and part of it was that we uh, we wanted to work with the with the guy. He had, he sort of seemed to have new ideas and fresh ideas, and he embarked on this after building these custom houses. And one of the big things that we uh, we discussed with him is that somehow he had to be able to access the trades that he'd been working with with this custom housing um, production. And the the reason why that was important is to again to make it affordable. So there's a huge difference between uh, hiring residential trades versus hiring commercial trades, at least where we come. From. From. And so then um, we needed to develop a scheme in which uh, he wasn't building a building block, but this was a stepping stone for him to get into so 
doing larger scale projects. And uh, so one day in studio, we, uh, we were collecting, uh, we collected these, uh, these iPods from the students uh, for a little, little video. And so talking about how it might be interesting to divvy up the project so that uh, there would actually be almost 18 individual or identifiable um, characters parts. within, some, within well, characters, family, but right? also parts of the project yeah. so that he could then divide up the construction in a way that made sense to him. Anyway, so, so as, as a result of the exercise that you saw there, we were playing with him, um, well, playing with him uh, 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 to produce these kind of um, foam models, and uh, this was the final result. So I hope they're visible. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I think what excites us and what excited us um, mm -hmm. in this project was exactly really finding that typology. And the, we're going to show you four housing projects, and all of, all of them are three-story walk-ups, which is typically considered to be the sort of the bottom end of the residential market. And then we've tried to um, investigate, if you wish, or we tried to test a different way of configuring them. So th this one actually sees the project uh, broken down to 18 individual units. Each, each vertical or each cube, if you wish, is is a box, and the, uh, the, the project sort of consists of several layers uh, dealing with both its site, site conditions, parking, uh, and the public space. Uh, I, I think uh, if, if there's a common thread, and I think uh, maybe we should switch the slide, if there's a common thread in, in the projects that we're going to show, it is, it is this idea of, of building the city, and I think um, Part of the building of the city is giving back to the city in every one of, in every one of our projects and giving back public space in, in, in one way or another. So the, the project, instead of sort of turning itself um, or turning its, its back onto the, uh, onto the city in one way or another, it creates this, extends the, the, the street, extends the public space. So you see several layers on your right hand side, starting with parking and then going to what actually is an equivalent of a basement, which actually allowed us to span a concrete roof about where people will park, and that became um, a little, an entry, if you wish, plaza, uh, a long street between the, between the cubes that most of the houses are accessed from. And then after that, each individual unit was, uh, was positioned on top. And the reason we were reaching up really was the idea that this, and, and again having this deck that was slightly removed from the street level, was because of this challenging context. So we wanted to create a boundary that wasn't really gated off, but somehow suggested that there is private space um, up there, or semi-private space, that would be available for the community that we expect to form here. Um, and um, so there would be eyes on that, uh, that particular public space, and, and vandalism would be therefore discouraged. And at the same time, if get, of course, it provided this, uh, this uh, parking amenity. And we were reaching up, again, to capture the views that we'll have um, a little bit uh, better slide on later on uh, towards downtown and towards, um, towards the river itself. So the, uh, each one of these, uh, each one of these cubes sort of became a, a standard module that we started wor work with, um, and based based on the light access and so on. But what was interesting, I, I think, what's most interesting um, about the project is we've sort of developed a strategy that allowed us to design uh, each one of them without actually um, thinking about proportions or thinking about design. Um, of any particular element, which was this continuous ribbon of space that you occupy, and every time, which is basically a floor, so we're not trying to to um, define something new. So basically, every time the floor would hit a exterior wall, it would create a window, wrap up, and then um, bounce back, and that that created uh, quite a, an interesting uh, succession of lofts and open spaces through the building. Um, you can see sort of that. Um, sort of system followed through the building. So you, the, the entire, the cubes are actually filled in um, with this uh, almost organic faceted geometry of floors and, and, and walls and um, etc. And then the... Um, it allowed us not to have to design or compose the exterior, but, but more so um, allow the living spaces to dictate what uh, openings and apertures would be um, on the face of those rather sort of mundane or pared down um, modules themselves. One of the things we tried to stay away was is, is that sort of hand of the author when it comes to proportion or design. So we always try to invent these systems that allow us to do that. Now that made it entirely impossible for the uh, contractor to build, or he, he thought so. So the, uh, we went from really making it small so he can do it to 
making it really hard for them to do it. So we ended up doing the... Uh, Which doing, is a great outcome. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up doing these framing models, actually show every piece of framing, um, identifying how, how one does it, and actually made it quite simple. Sorry, explain it a bit better. I'm not sure if it made it quite simple. And the other outcome, of course, was that um, we realized that we have a secondary sort of public space in the, in the project, which really becomes these rooftops that uh, the neighbors are now occupying, and, and they, they're allowed to have discussions across, and actually it's a, it's a whole new terrain up, up, in the, up in the sky. And some images here to just show you what the, uh, what the characteristics of the interior became. Um, so it isn't about uh, dividing it up in a maximum amount of square footage, but it really, he discovered, is about selling the experience. And to us, this was huge. Uh, he actually ended up selling the units within the tw first 24 hours of putting them in the market and discovered that through this exercise that, um, that design can sell and there's something more that you can sell except the quanti uh, quantitative factor, but you can also sell quality of space in a whole different, mm -hmm. different so way. You can see on, on your left side, or left yeah, on your left-hand side, so a succession of lofts, of lofts through the space uh, as the ribbon actually bends up in the space. Each one of the, of the condos actually has a rooftop garden, as you can see, and that provides a, nest, a different landscape, a different communal landscape, if you wish, with, within the project. The, the, uh, the first phase, just, phase is just completed, and uh, we've got a couple shots, and uh, some of the first people have moved in into the project. Um, with one thing that we try to do with, um, with all of our clients and all our projects, we want to maintain the relationship that allows us to have beer at the, um, at the end of the project. And the, uh, this is uh, Johanna's husband. They didn't quite explain. I think no. what we're trying to maintain is that maintain a good enough relationship. Like building the, uh, the deck not, and have a beer? Well, it's not about the okay. beer. I'm, just, right. I'm trying to elaborate that it's about try, <laughs> trying to maintain a relationship where we actually are that comfortable with our clients that I mean we can have this kind of a celebratory moment. So anyway, sorry. Thank you. That was brilliant. I'm here to help you. Yep. One. One down. More to go. Um, so this is this is one of the first projects that we, we've uh, we've gotten in our um, in, in the office once we established it from the client that we worked with in the past. And he had sort of this brief that comes out of uh, a dream brief I guess. Uh, he uh, he told us he wants a condominium projects that fits, fits the budget, but he wanted to, to get an award for it. And that was sort of a, a, a marvelous program. We, uh, we sort of knew we wanted to take it there as well, so we, we tried our best to do so. So this is on, um, on uh, Wall Street, which in Winnipeg is just uh, west of uh, downtown, about uh, 10 minutes uh, drive. And yeah, again, you're really helpful. Uh, there's Portage Avenue, if you're familiar with, uh, with Winnipeg at all, which cuts through the entire city and goes from downtown to all the way to the west end of the perimeter. And, um, and this uh, particular site is in, uh, in the industrial strip uh, that's still quite active in the area, but then backing on to quite a mature um, housing, um, housing area. And uh, the site is 350 by 100 feet long, and he wanted to develop just uh, around 25 to 30 units onto the, onto the site. And I'll just give you... So just want to show some of the context. On the left-hand side is the sort of your typical big box industrial environment, 30 foot, 30 foot tall corrugated, white corrugated or off-white beige corrugated boxes. And on the right is, is sort of the mature, the nature of the mature neighborhood. So those four houses right. and, and mature trees is, is really what. So we very much uh, took that to heart and took our um, site, which was the uh, this. Uh, abandoned parking lot and then started thinking about what are the ways to inhabit the site. One unfortunate thing about the site itself is that it allowed us, uh, the regulation allowed us to build to the property line. So we actually, from the beginning, we've envisioned this, this idea of filling up the site and then carving within it, carving a space for the uh, for the new well, community. Well, the notion was that we somehow emulate the big box development that's around us, or the industrial development that's around us, and then try to make most of the footprint that we're given. So very quickly, of course, um, as an architect, or as designers, most of you are, 
would know that it really is about uh, housing development, it's about access to the perimeter and access to windows, and often um, too deep of a floor plate is not really useful. So our process was to position this so-called box or this maximum square footage on the site and then start, start carving away at it um, with, with ending up this sort of green oasis that we felt could be, again, addition to the city, part of the city, sort of a pocket of uh, space that the community that was sur uh, surrounded would would start to um, use as their own amenity. So as you can see, so we've ended up, by the, by the time it was all said and done, we ended up with six buildings um, surrounding the site with a courtyard in the middle. Uh, nothing necessarily innovative, but we've um, <clears throat> We made the, uh, the the main building block. Uh, we maximized the structure, so actually he was getting the best yields for that, so we could spend that money elsewhere. One of the one of the things that we tried to do, sorry, in every every project, is try to find places where we can save money in order to spend it on other parts of projects, not necessarily to save the client money. But yeah, and I guess the biggest thing about this project that we are sort of proud of is the fact that we tried to think in systems, and in this particular case, the system is is hollow core uh, slab on on wood frame which sounds odd, but the Holocaust really became something that allowed us to integrate the architecture, the stru structural systems, and the mechanical systems together into sort of one, one um, uh, system, for the lack of a better word, and, um, and what that meant is that it's all based on a four-foot uh, module, um, so the architecture uh, is created around that, and that, of course, uh, then once you strip one of these uh, Holocaust pieces away, then it leaves a four-foot space that can fit a stair and, uh, and a mechanical core for each one of the units. So each of the units is a loft, as you can see, with a with a with a very simple stair and a um, very simple mechanical core, and the, all the plumbing backs up on it. So we've tried to minimize that, so we can actually, again, spend the money elsewhere. So the um, this is sort of the the, the plan. Uh, he's just about 80% um, finished building two two of the two of the six blocks, and starting with the rest. Um, Surely, I think you're going to see some pictures of that. Yeah, but what's left in the middle then is um, is part of uh, or a very key part of the project, and that is that green space. And we actually turned that into um, into uh, well, Bioswale. Bioswale, that's right. Uh, so instead of spending money on on establishing or putting catch basins on the site, uh, we're collecting the water to. Um, to feed the, the the wildlife or the the plant life on the on the site, and even as far as uh, trying to figure out what kind of plant we can we can plant that would then um, attract a certain kind of bird that would then eat the mosquitoes that would come from the site, would come uh, uh, attracted to the stagnant water on site. So it's been quite a complex uh, uh, complex research project from that perspective. So the project actually assumed this dual nature of the inside and outside of the of the of the big box, and every time we cut this big box, we were, we were looking for something to, to sort of resonate or, or to work with the courtyard. So um, I'm not sure how we came up to this point, but we've sort of taken, a pixel, taken an image of, of forest and pixelated and turned it into, turned it into cladding. So um, creating a, quite a stark contrast between what's inside the courtyard and what's outside. So one actually reads quite easily um, where they are in the project, and hopefully they get sucked in, in between the buildings into the project by seeing this color. And as opposed to beige, uh, Sasha really likes green, so this is also <laughs> as opposed to beige. So, so it's just a conceptual diagram of that, um, of what the, uh, the pixelation of the uh, of the perimeter interior perimeter is supposed to look like, and then the uh, these are some of the uh, of the renderings that are produced on top of the model to demonstrate the nature of that space. So the uh, there's a time that would be rendering alongside um, with the age of the building, and then uh, then the the pixelated forest would color the courtyard while uh, while we have the long winters and we actually don't get this greenery that we're displaying here. Yeah, and each one of the spaces is lofts, as, as we've said. Whoa, are oh. we out of power? Oh shoot, we forgot to plug in. This yeah. is hilarious. Excellent. Okay, not planned, but comical nevertheless. Um, sorry. Why don't you do an interpretive dance? I'm not going to do an interpretive dance. I hope you get to it very quickly. Oh. Savior. So this one would go under here. Sorry. The light is not on. Oh, there we go. You have to say okay to that you're running out of power. 
Bear with me. Good. We didn't have to start from the beginning. Uh, Although that's always an option. <laughs> So anyway, so you can see the glimpses of the um, of the interior sort of peeking out uh, through the cracks between the buildings and and, and providing that, that that contrast within the uh, within the environment. And I think it's worth mentioning that of, of course, uh, with any project, there's always uh, there's always things that one could do differently, and, and we've definitely had our fair share of commentary back on this particular project about about its turning back it, its its back to the community and and how do we how do we deal with that. Um, and um, those are some of the things that we are making a call on what we think is right, and we felt that in the industrial park, the way that it is right now, it isn't particularly conducive to that street life, and our project within that context is not going to make the kind of difference um, that one would need. So we were happy with the glimpses and trying to provide the, the oasis for, for the immediate community around it, and we'll see how it works out. I mean, that's definitely something that uh, is for someone else to say and not for us. Each one of these projects is sort of an experiment in, in, in both density and, and typology, I guess. So so here's some of the spaces uh, inside as they're being constructed. No, and, um, not yet there. Oh, sorry, inside the courtyard, I meant, and, um, and the inside. So it, again, very, very simple typology with frame construction. And the um, we're very excited to see the color on the... Um, on the project. And the contractor absolutely loved the fact that they had to figure this color by or paint by number system, but uh, they were great. They actually mm -hmm. really came to, came to the table and, and did their part, so there we go. So that's the two, and I, I think again, I just want to point the, uh, the, this idea of giving back, to, um, giving back to the city and the idea of creating a place uh, in which city can start to exhibit it, inhabit the program or inhabit the project. And the, um, if you do that, I think then our projects or any project becomes, uh, becomes part of your, of your daily life without it actually being, um, and it improves the fabric. I think that's, that's one of the main ideas. And I guess it's to say also that it's not necessarily easy to do that. And these aren't every part of the brief that you get from a client, but somehow we feel that it's our responsibility as, a, as the architects to try to figure out how do we extract that out of the budget that they do have and how do we make the project better and be responsible to our clients still um, in that context. Right, so the third one is actually um, designed not as a condominium, but as a co-op um, uh, housing project for, uh, for a public agency, and they're hoping to turn it into a rent-to-own and, um, and turn it to the ownership of the people that live there for now. But it's located in an in a inner city and uh, within a context that's so very similar to this. this. These houses are actually right across the street for, from where the project is on one of the busiest streets in the city. And uh, it's, it's a fairly, again, a fairly hostile environment uh, from from a number of different ways, uh, or for a number of different reasons. Not only is the traffic um, a detriment to sort of a housing uh, sentiment or, or scale, but also the uh, most, most of these houses are abandoned at the moment and so on. So the project in a certain way had to act as a catalyst for the, uh, for the area. And then uh, we really in the project, um, we sort of asked ourselves what, what should the nature of that project be? And this, this sketch itself came, came much later, but uh, the discussions were very much about the, uh, the life that it could um, instigate perhaps uh, amongst its amongst its residents so that was sort of where where this sketch was actually trying to portray uh, accepting that the uh, you know there's going to be clothes lines and then the uh, and people will be uh, doing all kinds of guerrilla things on the on the project. Well, and we should be fair to the process. I mean, it, it was years and years of, and in the development at one point, um, this was actually to be a uh, housing development for uh, new Muslim Im immigrants. And so we went through a whole process of understanding what uh, what it meant. And, and actually, interestingly enough, it turned out that um, I guess as part of the Sharia law, yeah, you're not able, you're not allowed to, to borrow money. Uh, money, so that's where the co-op came from. But I think it partially informed our design and inspired us to think about what the, what the life is outside of your home um, in southern climates, you know, what that actually gives us as an extension of the home. And I think that's part of the kind of life that we're trying to depict in this, this image, and how could we possibly have that in Winnipeg, um, regardless of the, of the winter. So just for a sense of scale, you can see here the, the scale of the project is six small residential lots. Uh, they're about 28, 
feet wide by about, by, by about 75 feet uh, deep each. And the, um, the client, um, so it's typically uh, six lots, but the client came up with a program that um, required 25 units for this thing to work. So basically that's the density that they work with. And uh, we've tried a number of things, a uh, number of sort of typical um, typical schemes, including the side-by-side uh, -side housing, row housing, you know, and, and any kinds of three-story walk-ups, maintaining the um, the idea that it had to remain three stories in order to be affordable. And the uh, and then we went back to trying to and yeah, and then we went back to trying to figure out. Well, you know, one of the biggest issues that we see in in the Canadian context or North American context in general is just how much space we all occupy per square foot, and how different that is in other parts of the world, and how could we possibly start to affect the attitudes about that in, in the Winnipeg contest context. Um, and uh, we sort of configured, we sort of figured that both of us grew up in, in, in rooms and spaces that were much smaller than what's the expectation in, in this context. And you know sort of it generally, shows, yeah. generally turned out okay. Uh, regardless of those those limitations, and then we took those minimum requirements and thought we're we're much better off um, um, of promoting this kind of sustainability than adding a whole bunch of mechanical systems, let's say, onto a project to try to mitigate the amount of space that we built in the first place. So we actually gotten down to the bottom, or trying to, to create a module that uh, that we could work with, and discovered that any room um, that we need to build within the uh, within any apartment or dwelling needed to be only eight feet wide, um, except for the master bedroom and the living room. So the uh, so we then started looking at different configurations, trying to think how we could do that. And then you can see some here, and then you can see some the way these uh, actually turned out to be uh, once, once the project was finished. But starting from that, um, we actually realized that if we were to follow uh, just the math, the simple math behind the project, we, should, we could design a project that would be Especially about... a bit of a math geek. 65, yeah, 65 to 75% of the actual requirements in terms of the area. And if you succeeded in that, then we would actually definitely be designing something that has a long-lasting value when it, come, when it comes to the embodied energy and the amount of, um, amount of the effort that went into building it and so on. But it was interesting because we hadn't really designed something from the inside out, we thought before, and this was kind of a reversal of that process. So what should it be is, is really um, based on the configurations of the units themselves or configuration of the rooms even on a smaller, smaller scale. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the nature of the spaces that were created in the project ultimately uh, using this, um, this sort of very strict geometric um, puzzle, if you wish, and so on. So we actually had, had a couple of people in our office sort of sit in the middle of the office for about two weeks, understanding that knowing exactly the number of modules, the number of bedrooms we needed to supply for 25 units and so on, uh, there was a large demand for larger three and four story, uh, three and four bedroom units. So they, they kept on testing different different models. In essence, starting from this initial premise of using using these eight foot wide bars and just placing them on the site, and then working to try to um, try to create exterior space from it, as you can see here. And the eight foot was important here too because we were able to build with dimensional dimensional lumber as opposed to TGIs and and something that's more engineered, and that made a big dent in or a big sort of positive dent in the budget. Um, again, we were able to allocate those monies elsewhere because we were able to use the most rudimentary building building materials. Yeah, the base piece I would use is a 2 by 10 so that's the um, that, that's where the project went. So went through a number of iterations and this is sort of a post-rationalized diagram of how how the um, the actual space um, space came to be. Uh, so we, as you, as you remember, we started with 25 units which sort of promised to look like this if you were to follow a, a basic uh, a basic development scenario and ended up looking like um, like this where you can see 25 different call them touchdown points e units either start on the first or the second floor so the little squares that you see are the stair landings that take you up to the second floor from which the unit some of the units start and became entirely a, a puzzle of, of, of pieces and but I think we think still responding to the uh, to the general scale and nature of the of the street that it's on did I hit it or no there we go so the, uh, the project became this, uh, its geometry is entirely derived from the modularity that we established in the beginning, but then the, uh, through configurations of these we were able to create uh, spatial richness, I guess, that uh, I think the project aimed at from the beginning. Might have also helped that we both love Tetris. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, here you can see the sort of configuration of units, and the, there's not a single unit that's like another one, and the, uh, which is 
doesn't help when you get to the working drawings, but we've tried to work within some sort of modular, modular explanation so people could actually build from that. Uh, it was really scary building these things, up, especially for, for Colin, who was, who was uh, doing the work during the, during the construction, because everything just seemed, it was so, so funny when you saw the gray beams at eight feet apart, and thinking somebody's going to live there. We, would never, we, never, we thought we took the scale wrong somewhere, some, some, something didn't work out. But the uh, actual and, got... Yeah, and Sasha hates me telling the story, but I think it's important to, again, get to the realities of what happens with some projects. Um, so there was a woman who then had rented apartment after the project was finished and showed up at the front door with her suitcases and, and dropped the bags and started crying and said, I just can't live here, it's too small. So, um, you know, it happens to us, right? And uh, it takes time to get, get uh, changed attitudes and, and so forth. But again, we feel that, you know, probably 90% of these people are quite happy with the spaces that they have and excited to, to be living there. So well, one of the things that we've done initially is, is knowing that we, we, we are creating tight environments is we've actually bought furniture for one of the suites and donated that to the project so the people could see how one could actually inhabit the suite in a, in a spacious yeah, it, it might not be a puffy couch from brick or mm -hmm. that's the maybe the problem and um, the landscape is slightly uh, less uh, lush than in the re previous project we hope this tree grows some yeah it survives yeah. Um, <laughs> The other thing, I mean, we, we get asked about the color, or we have been asked about the color a few times, and, and really what we were trying to do here is because it was so tight in the courtyard, there's only about 30 feet from one side of the block to the other, is we try to make sure that it light bounces in it, and that there, there's a sense that, because again, it's a fairly sketchy area, that there's a lot of eyes on the street, and, and so the windows are highlighted in a way that, you know, you get a sense that somebody's always looking. Um, yeah, you never know how many people are actually yeah. In the windows and those small windows and so on. So the, um, that's in essence what it is. And I think I think it's the moment it's starting to sort of starting to learn how to how to live. I think so. I'll go back. I th oh, sorry, that's the slide I wanted. It is the moments like uh, that girl playing. I can't believe she had an orange ball. But um, yeah, sounds good. Cool, cool, <laughs> but the, uh, when there's people that are starting to inhabit this, and you have to. The, the nature of the environment is quite interesting. There's in, in, in a three bedroom will have eight to ten people living, so it, it is a quite an intense, uh, intense environment. I'm not sure how we're able to take these pictures without anybody in them at the moment. Again, speaks of our success in this you know, <laughs> in this space. Um, well, the next project is again in the vein of the, the three-story walk-up um, housing um, project. Now, going back to the condominium uh, typology, uh, this particular client uh, wanted us to explore the notion of a white box and, and what it would be like if you let let your um, future tenant or your future purchasers to decide exactly how, what goes on inside, and then they get to retrofit their their spaces the way they want. And so then, I guess the big question there is, is what do we as architects do and how do we drive something that's exciting and still drives us um, in, in that sort of a project? So the, uh, so as, you, as Johanna mentioned, we, wanted, we, we took that concept, or the idea of the white box, the extreme, and said, well, we shouldn't then even determine where the kitchens or bathrooms are and so on. So we tried to develop a system that allowed us to do that with, with implanting infrastructure into the building without knowing what people wanted to do with it. And I should mention, because the slides are slightly weird order, that this is actually one of our first projects that is in a suburban context and, and, and really so affluent and, and, and uh, well-to-do neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so the, uh, the first thing we asked ourselves is what are the ways that we can configure a unit in. And the, uh, we've tried the, you know, the flat and the townhouse type and we've tr tried, tried to stagger it. But I think we got really excited when we figured out the, uh, that we can actually um, break each one of the units into, into three individual modules, connect them with stairs, and then have units travel through the building, therefore allowing for corner views, corner orientations, uh, double aspect, and, um, and sort of the, uh, a unique spatial configuration. So as you can see here, each one of the units sort of consists of a stair in the middle, and then three modules that sort of plug off of that stair. And the, when you combine them all, this is what they look like. Uh, 
and the, uh, the system of stairs that are all private uh, allowed us to um, actually sell every, every square foot of the project because everything that we built actually got sold as part of the project. And, uh, and then the public space that we keep trying to infuse into these projects exists on a slightly more um, modest scale here, but still uh, we negotiated from the uh, get-go that we must have the screen that uh, in the end surveils over the project and in between that and the actual body of the building is where that interaction with your neighbor happens and, and for, fortunately we were able to maintain that although there were several attacks at that because again it's seen as an almost extra to the project um, throughout so its can, life. Yeah, there's one more thing, we wrote, there's better drawings showing that as well but here you can see sort of the, we had to reinvent the way the um, utilities are uh, run through the project because we had to move air through the, uh, between the three, the three spaces but we had to uh, move water and, and sewer vertically and so on so that, that actually uh, uh, we had to sort of reinvent that in order to in order to make the project work. Yeah, and it sure, didn't we didn't work anything. Well, we just had to figure out how it works. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Sorry. Yeah. The, um, so this is uh, this is the configuration of the project. This is the ten units, hence block ten, and the um, the ten actually fit in a, in a fairly uh, fairly. Uh, straightforward manner once you know what the system is. This allows us to have eight out of ten units to uh, touch a corner, so therefore have a room in a corner. And the uh, allowed for all of them obviously to face each side of the, uh, the private side, the public side of the property. But I think the other, the other part where we've tried to create this community is one that's sort of more it's not visual and it's more sensual and uh, I think everybody, which, is, which could sort of be a, um, a sound nightmare, but it, it isn't because it's built right now, everybody touches, I think, at minimum four different neighbors, uh, either, either via stairs or, or, or by the, just the nature of the proximity of the, uh, of the uh, or the other, the other rooms that actually belong to others. So here you can see a section through it trying to depict the idea of differences that can happen within the, uh, within the white box. It's sort of the Hollywood squares of picture here. And we tried to imagine, I mean, it fueled our imagination to try to imagine the lives of the people who were there and then sort of that brushing uh, by one another and I imagining what, the, what kind of community would be created. And, and the cowgirl, you can see, is very happy in her unit. I think this slide actually is supposed to show that, that the space between the building and, yes, and the screen you. that yes. actually connects all these units outside. So um, this is the attempt. This just shows you the, the project is located on Grand Avenue in, in, in the neighborhood called River Heights, uh, for those of you that, that, that know Winnipeg. And it's a reclaimed and older um, gas station site that nobody else wanted. So we're gassing these people as well as uh, placing them in a very... Excellent. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, the remediation was done. So shouldn't be any issues. Uh, the, uh, so the, this is some, these are the renderings of the project when we were still designing it and thinking about it. That would be the back and the front. And the, uh, one of the interesting struggles we had with the project was that the geometry that developed in order to, uh, to support the screen was a geometry of, of protruding boxes that resulted in a, in a relatively, I don't want to say powerful, but sort of strong geometric scheme. Well, everybody knows we like boxes. Yeah. The, yeah we can afford boxes, uh, is that the, uh, when it became such a strong geometry, the, that's the first thing the client saw and said, well, maybe we can do away with the screen. So that was an interesting, interesting sort of development, and uh, we definitely did not want to do that, so we maintained it. Um, and then now, looking back at it, I, I think you know, one of the, the best parts of it, of course, is these uh, bigger window uh, sections or the protrusions out of the main body of the, of the overall building block um, are the ones that puncture through the screen and you get a clear view uh, across and each unit has at least um, one or two of these, these uh, big views over either the street or onto the, onto the um, backyard. There's one that has three and it's absolutely stupid as well, but it's, it's, it's kind of stunning. That was a very important mm -hmm. addition. Um, and then also, uh, I think what, what excited us about it is to just to be able to see this clear view of the stair and somehow the stair being um, at, the, at the spine of the, at the, of the project. And I think it's similar to the, the university center here. Mm -hmm. There's something nice about having that continuous trajectory. Yeah. And people are fit living in this project, right? Well, that's true. So, the, uh, yeah. so this is some shots of the screen from within the decks that are inside. I'm not sure they're very um, descriptive, they're very architectural. Um, and the, uh, this is the project in its, in its finished stage. It just got uh, occupied. Well, it's not quite back. finished, but mm -hmm. uh, sort of 90 percent, so the uh, landscaping is not done. This is on the backyard, um, and this view from the street just after removing the construction fence mm -hmm. from around it. 
so this is sort of, this four project sort of showed, I think to us, we always wanted to do a recap, uh, and I'm, maybe these lectures are helping us to do that, a recap of our housing um, efforts, if you wish, or intentions. We don't know, we, we know, we don't, we don't know what those intentions are, but each time we've tried to revisit the typology in order to, to see if there's something that um, something else that we can do with it. So that's that's where they're coming, really coming from. And um, I'm going to take you to yeah. two, two public projects um, and uh, and one project that's in design right now. How are we doing for time? We should probably Still, speed up yeah, a little bit. Up. Um, this is part of the University of Winnipeg um, called the Annex, or renamed it the Annex. And, and what it is is um, the University of Winnipeg is located in downtown Winnipeg, so not the, not the suburban campus one, the U of M. But um, what they're doing is it's been a very, uh, very sort of impermeable block uh, within the city uh, for quite a number of years. And it, recently, uh, the university administration has been wanting to uh, make that better boundary and connection to the city much more, uh, much more... Porous, open. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Great. I'll, I'll tell you the words. That's good. Excellent. Um, so, what part of this is, um, is now reclaiming um, a space that was habited by the uh, Greyhound Terminal in downtown, and they moved next to the airport further afield. And so we, uh, we got the commission to turn this rather ambiguous and uh, facadeless uh, space into a university um, student center. And, um, and we failed miserably, we'll tell yes, you about well, that. Yes, we'll tell you about that. That's part of a life, I think, of, of an office. Um, so we, um, in the beginning, uh, imagine all of this permeability. The, the university itself is on the... Uh, on your left here, and, and um, actually an important component of that project was that uh, because of it being uh, formerly the Greyhound Terminal, it now was to be the Winnipeg Transit's new uh, hub where the, where the buses from the city would come, uh, come and bring uh, people to downtown. And so we had to maintain that kind of mix and, and mingle between people and, and vehicles, and at the same time try to open, again, this sort of ambiguous space into um, into something more coherent. Um, so we figured out all kinds of ways to, to do that, open up the entrances, the, the, um, and then create a large, larger space within, as you can see at the bottom uh, middle slide, uh, with people that can move through there and then inhabit that with sort of sporadic program as it was um, yeah, well, by there were two major, two major tenants that we also had to uh, make sure would fit in here. In the, in the bottom, in the middle, um, you can see that we decided that the two major tenants would go on the edges of this of this place, and in the last picture there in the corner, um, the smaller uh, smaller uh, retail spaces and so forth, and, and university um, support spaces would be sprinkled into the open area. And our, our thought was, again, this is sort of a city almost on a mini scale, and within that there would be nooks and crannies where the, where the students could uh, congregate and, and uh, you know, talk amongst themselves or sort of water cooler um, discussions. And then what was left for us to do is trying to figure out some way to give it an identity. Again, it was very sort of ha uh, hazard space, sort of mumble jumble together, and we tried to figure out a way that we could we could give it this identity and something that would be would be connecting um, it. We drew some inspiration from whatever this is called, um, and the, um, there's actually three buildings that are we're using their ground floor, and the, neither one of them has a has a street presence. I think that's sort of yeah, the there are various ceiling heights and and all kinds of mechanical work and right. and so on. And of course, we had to keep the floor quite level for accessibility and, and so forth. So that wasn't something we could tamper with. So we came up with a sort of a system of pipes that actually emulates this um, this. Uh, diagram or an image, so the system of pipes that allowed us to do things and our unifying factor or our unifying um, geometry or unifying element was the, um, was the ceiling that actually was suspended off the, uh, off the uh, existing structure. So about 30,000 pipes cut the different, um, different lengths, it created this upside down landscape and the, uh, this is sort of the worm's eye view of, of what that could be um, within the space. Some of the uh, some of the images here give you the uh, this idea. So in, instead of instead of dividing, I guess, the building elements into uh, into separate building elements such as walls, mechanical system, electrical systems, ceiling systems, and so on, um, we we actually 
discovery that this one uh, pipe landscape, if you wish, in some instances that touches the ground and creates creates point of contact between the users and, and the building would be um, sort of the unifying element that would solve all those things and then that's act right. as a so light and etc. Light and, and the mechanical distribution and um, and you know tables and chairs and different different pieces separate, separating screens and, and so yeah. forth. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we imagine and very sort of free flowing. We made a big departure from the box from the cube clearly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, so really going out there and trying it out. And then what happened was politics. And um, the, the president of the university, Lord Axworthy, can I say that? I think I can say that. Um, he, had a, he had a friend who then uh, owned a pizza, pizza joint. Um, and they together decided that they were going to shoehorn this pizza joint, God, I can't say that, into the space. And we basically lost all of this public space and lost our um, ambition to, to be able to provide that for the students. And really became sort of... We sort of scrapped all the, idea, the, the ideas. We kept the pipes. If you have a project where you want to use the pipes, go ahead. Um, the, uh, they're very inexpensive. Uh, and, uh, very multi-use. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they work do all kinds of things with them. Kinds of things, but it's not happening in this project, so... But the reason we, reason we put that up, because, I mean, we didn't, uh, we didn't give up with, without a fight, so we went through this process for about two years trying to convince the university that there were higher goals that, that they must set forth and, and they have to act as, as the sort of um, trailblazers of public space and really isn't this important and, and so forth, but again, the economic, economic forces here got the better of us. You mean the friendship forces? Well, those two. Okay, so the, the, the next project, so that's what it is, it's a huge disappointment, do not go there when you're in yeah. Winnipeg. Please uh, don't. Doug, make sure you're not there uh, when you're there. Um, the, the next last build project we're going to show you is the uh, Old Market Square stage. Uh, this was a sort of invited competition we've entered, uh, subsequently won, uh, to create a um, year-round venue in, in, a, one of the, in, in a park in the middle of the... Um, of the exchange district, which is sort of the um, turn of the century, turn of the previous century um, collection of buildings, as you can see here, the, the only real urban um, part of Winnipeg. Uh, and then the building is, in itself, is supposed to, or was supposed to replace an existing stage, which you can see here being a very historicist um, sort of approach to, uh, to a band shell. So the, uh, the park was there and the site was there, so they were looking for something to, uh, to replace the stage. And um, we, I think we got the commission, um, well, we got it, uh, first of all, I think we got on the short list because uh, actually we, both of us live right next to it and we had a very intimate relationship and felt very passionate about this particular park. Um, it serves as the fringe and, and the uh, jazz festival um, uh, center in the summer and all of these um, sort of grassroots events that take place have been have been centered here. So in some time Winnipeg transforms or explodes or this, yeah. this part of Winnipeg explodes into this um, sort of carnival of people and, and events and so on and lasts about uh, Four weeks is a total. Like it's not consecutive, and uh, we live right above it. And we're, we're so um, it's so difficult for us to separate ourselves from that. So we actually spend every night sitting in the park and drinking beer. In my case, um, and beer. then the. Um, but then, well, and, and I guess, but the but the sad part about it is that more often than not, so 90% of the time, it really was an empty, uh, empty city core. It didn't see this life that you know someone visiting from the from the suburb would would see it uh, take during those festivals. But it really was the sort of sad looking part that it was never used. And we tried to figure out um, as a response to the to the mini competition that they ran as how do we overcome that and how do we give it. A life outside of that performance um, activity. So basically that's where it came, boiled down to, we were wanting to look at, at how we can actually do this. Um, so it actually had some appeal, 365. Um, oh, look, it's a cube. And yeah, it was a cube. So th this, this, this ha happened later. We didn't know it was supposed to be a cube. Uh, thinking about what is it that, that would or could do that for 365 days, it, it needed to be something that caused fascination in, a, in one way or another. So sort of we're drawn back to the uh, 2001 Odyssey, Odyssey and the monolith that was actually that was able to transcend the actual environment and then be something or emanate some sort of energy that nobody is um, aware of what it is, but it actually was there. And it had to have a soul within that's maybe hidden behind the um, behind the makeup and behind the screen. Um, not not that much different from a mime artist. 
So I think this is an awkward transition uh, in the presentation. We've tested all different kinds. Once we knew it was cube, we tested all different kinds of what this how the cube could actually operate and what it could be from within. So Sorry, yeah. I, I should say that you know, I, I think that we're, we're oftentimes salespeople and we are every day that we try to sell our ideas to, to whomever is willing to pay for them. And in this case, we had a very, uh, quite a gimmicky approach and we actually had an iPhone uh, with the flash, you know, the flash uh, app, which changes color, and we had positioned our model on top of that. And so we took this to the presentation and the cube was glowing from within and they were all mesmerized by, by this flashing object. We had no idea how to do it and so on. So yeah. they, and then that got us the, got us the win, I think. Yeah, the commission. The and so point. therefore, they had already decided that it was going to be the cube. We had three different options and so on. Anyway. Yeah, so once they decided it was a cube, then we had to try to, to figure out a way to, to sort of make it as, as multifunctional, if you wish, or, or as... Um, as 365 days as possible. So. And, yeah, and we decided that it really should have two components, really, to, to be able to speak of it being not looking empty when there was no performance. And so relatively soon in that process, we determined that there was this inner core, uh, the structure that held the piece together, and then we would have a veil around that that would allow it to look closed in uh, when, uh, when it was just a part mm -hmm. function. So actually, it, it did become it did become a cube uh, with a sort of a concrete structure inside. It's an open open air venue, and then the uh, aluminum veil of uh, or a custom screen around it. Uh, I, I think one of the major sort of positives for the project itself is is, is how many things it can do uh, while remaining, uh, I guess, a cube. The um, as we're going through it, we were able to develop different programs uh, that could be nestled, if you wish, within the, uh, within the cube geometry. Um, some of the most important ones being the, uh, the three different stages that it created. It created a stage towards the park, so actually the events could be held in the park. Um, it created uh, that passive projection as well from the uh, uh, using its concrete structure, so actually the amplification of sound did not need to be uh, really um, uh, really great, really large, and yet um, it was able to create a stage on top of the uh, a little intimate stage on top of the uh, on top of the roof, just using that slope that came out from the uh, from the acoustic acoustical studies we did. And then we wanted it to become a pavilion that can be used for a number of different things. As you can see here, um, it actually has been used for everything except for uh, for a sort of sculpture exhibit. Uh, but we're hoping to have some of those happen this uh, this coming year. This is an image from the inside and there's something quite um, sort of magical about that, the way that the light falls in there. For me, it's probably the sort of, it's most satisfactory of the projects that we've done. And this is only because I'm, we've been struggling with the idea of building two by four and two by six walls that then get covered in some material that has nothing to do with what the frame is. And here, we're actually uh, able to sort of somehow stay true to, uh, it is concrete, you see it's through and through that, and every part of the project that, or every building component that's there is actually visible. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, what happens to the screen is the screen actually gets pulled in. Uh, this is sort of one of the, um, sort of one, one of the very important discoveries that we made, which was the, if, if the screen was to be opened up and pulled out, therefore disintegrating the, the, the nature of the box, we felt like the cube itself would be lost. So um, somewhere in this process we decided that the only way we can actually allow for, for the cube to get modified in order to become a bench shell or a stage is if the screen is moved in. So you're going to see a couple more pictures of that. But there's different types of events that happen within. Um, we've, um, we've seen parties um, that happen within and it house quite a few people. Did you do it? Yes, um, and you can see, uh, you can see here how the uh, how it opens for a relatively, are you flipping back and forth, a relatively, relatively small, ve small venue. Uh, the other thing that was actually important, uh, important for the. Um, uh, for the project was lighting, and we're going to talk about it in a, in a, in a second as well. The, uh, this is just this is a gory picture of our office. Um, Johanna and I are hiding. Uh, the, uh, the only reason we have it here is to show it, and this is the only picture we have of the upper stage or the uh, little bleacher amphitheater on top of the roof. Um, the, the way the screen works, we've actually looked at a number of possibilities to, to, uh, to purchase and so on, but there was a number of things that it had to do and uh, we were not able to, uh, to find that. So actually it resulted in this great uh, game of discovery, working with the manufacturer, which is actually a Hutterite colony just outside of, uh, outside of the city. And we've, um, 
we discovered through playing with uh, perforated metal and so on that we can actually transfer light if we position the uh, if we position the screen in a proper way relative to the light, and we can transfer it from inside out. And this started from just simply um, projecting through that perforated metal, realizing that the picture actually got uh, picked up on the thickness of the material, and then generating a bunch of tests uh, with MDF, um, and one of them was sort of a louver, almost like um, you know, very, uh, horizontal blinds. And then we discovered that somehow, uh, through some magic that we can't even figure out, um, the picture gets transferred we to the other side. Well, we can't we now. now. That's right. right. We, do, we do get it. No. Yes. So actually, so uh, as a mover, as you can imagine, it isn't it isn't quite flexible. But as as a collection or as as a number of little boxes that actually that that were configured in in a, in a grid, uh, we could actually make it flexible in, in uh, two or three dimensions, which was actually essential for it being pulled back. So actually, tried to combine these two, invented this uh, or designed this custom aluminum extrusion that would be cut at an angle, not like a sausage, and the uh, salami or salami, and then it's such we figure out a way to. Uh, configure those to, to get an optimal um, optimal light transfer from one end and the geometry, its geometry also allowed us to turn the corner of the cube without creating a special corner piece. So the uh, you're jumping over the projector and so on. So oh, yeah. the, the, the cube has a projector inside as well, which is so gimmicky, but it does allow allow the um, the client, who's the city of Winnipeg, to use it as a for, for a relatively coarse projection. It was never intended to be one of those LED screens. Uh, we really like the idea of it being a relatively sorry very coarse, and uh, so it wouldn't allow for advertisements and commercials and so on. Um, but he also helped us uh, secure the projectors and the equipment inside, so mm -hmm. that was important for the client, so they could leave it in place. Is this going to play? I think so. I don't know. No. No. Okay, let's not worry about it. That's fine. Uh, the, uh, so, so the cube, I guess, let's just, just go back for a second. So the cube happens to function in a... Um, Oh, it is playing. Oh, it is playing. So it happens to function as a, as a, as a venue. Uh, people actually get pretty crazy around it. This is, there's a festival of electronic music. This is a band called Orb. The old, older people in the, in the uh, audience might remember that. Johanna like doesn't, you. I do. Uh, the, uh, so Orb and the Cube did uh, this marvelous event. And, uh, you know, it, it happens for now. Last year was the first official year, second uh, second year that Q was used, and I think there are, the number of days that they're using it now as, as a stage has gone to over 60, so the, uh, there's real uh, appeal in it, it seems. And so this is what it looks like at different, different but, times. No, I would like to suggest that we try to speed up through this okay, one. whatever they're called. So the, um, the street that this, uh, this building is on is on William Stevenson Way, hence Bond. Um, Tower, and that's sort of the, I, I think. Yeah, uh, in the series of key names for our project. That's right. Yeah, okay. So we won't really talk about this, but, um, but yeah, there are some ideas behind it and for the sake of have to wrap here. this up? Is that what it is? Um, no, I wanted to get to this point. This okay. is not one of our projects. Um, but however, it is the Mississauga Towers uh, by, um, by a citizen group, or, or they were the developers of it. And, and the reason why we're getting here is because is one of the things of, um, that we wanted to do as an office from the get-go, not only to produce architecture ourselves, but really try to promote the value of architecture to the community and to the public at large. And this especially um, to, the, to those who commission work. And um, through our migrating landscapes, our Venice Biennale project, we got to meet um, the citizen development group. And there's a modern story that goes with this, with this project, and, and some of you might be familiar with it, but really what it is is that they were able to um, really change the way that people view um, the cost of architecture and that design sells, and something that we've been trying to get at at a much different scale. Yeah, Sam Kringer, who is the developer behind this project, decided to organize an architectural competition which actually helped launch uh, MAD Architecture from China, who won the competition. And then uh, they were able, once they announced the project, they, not only did they, um, did they were able to sell it for about $50 a square foot more, so they've changed the, uh, the entire market in, in Toronto area, so they were selling condos at $350 at the time, and the, uh, these were selling for well over $400 a square foot. But they, were also, they also sold it... Um, 
in a, overnight. So it, it basically launched the project and uh, made them consider a second tower, which they've uh, which they've built now. So mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. it, and improved improved the value of architecture and design in in, in sort of their minds, and they're they're completely about numbers people. So the uh, which helped us immensely once we got to the Venice Biennale and talking to them and talking about the um, mm -hmm. value of architecture. So um, it, it is projects like this that actually make the. Um, make us excited about, or stories like that make us excited about promoting architecture to the to, to general public. What's happened in Winnipeg in the last uh, five, or six, uh, five or six years, there's been a, a certain renaissance of, of, of public projects in and, and, and architecture. We uh, now have um, a hydro building um, designed by um, KPMB on, uh, on your left. We have a um, City Airport, the new city airport designed by Caesar Pelli, and then um, they're both completed and, and in function and functioning. And then the, uh, the lastly, we have a Museum of Human Rights uh, located at Forks by Anton Predock that that's being constructed uh, as we speak. And I guess that's part of what's setting the scene in Winnipeg for our public discussion of architecture. And uh, we are uh, we and, and many of the other young, younger firms in the city are trying to tap into that discussion, really uh, really make it uh, something that can help us as a design community. This is a, this is a funny, um, funny sort of discussion that we stumbled upon on, in, of our cube itself or the stage. Um, we were hanging around it as it first got built and there was a lot of public, uh, public discourse about if it's an appropriate thing to do in the historic core and this is an actual comment uh, that uh, we were given. Both of them are actually one of them is by Jerry Ford that actually liked it and by somebody who actually really disliked it. So, uh, but the, the real point of the slide is, is the discourse and discussion and we, we've been getting a, a lot of flack for the project for building in a historic area in a ways that are that they're not emulating the brick construction of the uh, of the old buildings and so on. But the um, it has created a great um, a great or has divided the audience if you wish and in, in, in a great way. And the, as long as we're talking about architecture, we find find it quite successful for, because for quite a few years there's been no discourse or discussion. And these are two projects, obviously, that have a very similar um, similar program. And again, here we're trying to trying to uh, constantly convey to people that it's possible to extract that public space out of the project, even if it's even it has the same or very limited resources. And uh, these two projects happen at the same time. But the uh, this part of the presentation is, is sort of a presentation that we did to a, to a business community in Winnipeg. And I think that's important. They actually really understood that the value of design can actually improve their business position. So regardless of how big and uh, how important or how small and how unimportant their projects are. And I guess the other one is, is really just the civic responsibility that we all carry, whether whether we produce sort of this is Bay downtown Winnipeg and then one of the Walmarts uh, somewhere nearby. Um, and so what is the legacy that we leave for our future generations? What is the civic responsibility that we as an architectural community can, can carry forward? And uh, we wholeheartedly believe that we each have to participate in that production and, and try to convince the decision makers out there in our clients. To yes. Right. Speaking of decision makers, the uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority has recently, recently commissioned a uh, number of buildings to be built and uh, on a, as a turnkey operation, so they're owned by other developers and they'll be leasing them in perpetuity. Um, and um, I, I think we as architects need to um, take these, these, these projects extremely seriously. On the left-hand side is a project, both projects were built for the same amount of money uh, or same pro forma. Um, one is a three-story uh, stucco box. The other one is a combination of curtain wall and metal uh, siding um, project. They both house about the same amount of, uh, of office space for the uh, for the administration, and they're they're, they're delivered in the same um, same sort of constraints and market constraints. Um, and the, uh, it is the architect who took the effort to uh, to make the project on the right. I guess we can say it was us. Sort of horrible plug, but the uh, it was terrible. <laughs> it was just that. But the, the the fact is, sometimes the architects don't do that, and the. Um, Okay, and I'm in the big about our, do, you, do you want to say that? Yes. Cool. Um, so one comment, because you're going to talk about the next slide. One comment that we got back is we're presenting the, our design scheme to the client. And, and again, this wasn't really our client, but it was the health authority we had to present it to. We worked for a developer. Um, and they told us once we took the drawings and the renderings, and they said, it looks too 
nice, um, and we can't do that. And we said, well, it fits the budget, and it's completely responsible from that perspective. And I said, well, no, but there's public money involved, and if it looks too expensive, um, it probably sets the wrong message. And so this is, this is sort of a curious thing that we're trying to battle, and then trying to figure out, like, isn't, isn't the public... Um, public institutions and public, um, public organizations that should be at the foreground of, of doing something, um, something... Well, something to, to, to improve our civic life, if you wish. So yeah. what we did, we, we produced uglier drawings and we submitted them and they accepted that. So we did not change a thing and the building got built um, the way it was intended. So mm -hmm. use your presentation skills to their best, uh, if you can. <laughs> And we, uh, this last thing was uh, two years ago, there were two projects from Winnipeg that won the um, Canadian Architect Award of Excellence uh, in design. The one on the right we talked about. The one on the left is a hospital. And the, um, this is where the same uh, agency actually uh, stepped up to the plate and designed a project that, that was supposed to be a proud um, sort of pointer to the future for, uh, for the architecture of Winnipeg. But the, as part of our presentation to the business community, we said, that sure, the uh, institutions have to lead that, but there's nothing stopping you as a development community to, to, to try to figure out, try to push your architects, try to push your own imagination, try to create a marketable product that is actually better than um, the lowest common denominator. So that's, that's where and that is completely possible to do that in Winnipeg, which was our message to them. Um, the other things that we've been doing as, a, as an office to try to reach out to the public, this is a part of the warming huts uh, along the Winnipeg, um, well, the Red River that runs through Winnipeg, or actually a Cinnabon. It's a Cinnabon. Depends okay. on the Never mind. So um, there are two rivers, in fact. Um, <laughs> And uh, it, was a, it was a competition that, or actually it wasn't a competition to start with. The, the way it started is uh, there was a number of uh, us younger architects who got together and discussed the possibility of designing huts for the, for the Forks uh, River System and for the Forks uh, Development Corp. And um, it now has become an international design competition. Each year um, there's a competition call out for, for anyone to submit to. And this year actually thank you is designing one of the one of the pavilions. The building, as we speak, I think they're yeah. opening at the end of this week. That's right. That's right. So all of those things, I get, I guess, build that design community that we're all after and think will benefit us um, all in the future. Another one being, um, this is called on the boards, and this is actually an image of, of the event happening in our office, where um, architects get together and discuss their their work that they currently have on their plate and try to get critique and, and feedback from their colleagues. And so this is something that we're doing on a monthly basis. And I guess, uh, lastly, um, this is probably the cheapest civic project that we've attempted. This, this is just outside of our office, and it's four uh, used IKEA chairs, originally $49.99 each, that we uh, positioned in the summer um, out onto the street and changed their configuration every morning and put some architectural magazines onto, the, onto these uh, chairs and had various responses, obviously, as you can see. Some, some are reading them. So do we have another five minutes to talk about Biennale, Federica? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, and I guess that, that is the bridge to the building uh, to the migrating landscapes. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be selected as the curators and as the organizers of the uh, of the Canada's Biennale effort, together with our um, with our colleague Jay Sung Chong. And um, we have now been at it for about uh, eight months, I guess. Yeah. And uh, the, the way that the, the proposal that we made to the Canada Council uh, for the Arts was, um, was that we would somehow try to project um, a collection of young Canadian um, architects uh, to the Biennale to try to discuss what the future of Canadian architecture is. And um, since then, the project has evolved in, in such a way that um, we, um, uh, we ran a competition to, uh, to uh, accumulate this work or collect this work. But really, and again, I should show you the team. Um, to go uh, back a couple of steps, um, the Biennale in architecture is something that's quite well known in the world. And, and I'm 
to say this, but even my grandma back in Finland knows about it and, and knows what it means. And, and this year we're projecting to get about 270,000 uh, visitors to the Biennale. So it really is a big deal out there in the world. Um, and I think that uh, we believe that as Canadians, we probably have to be even a bit more aware, a bit more behind the project um, to support its, its journey um, to the world stage. And um, it's uh, the Biennale grounds uh, are just um, sort of on the tip um, or the edge of, of Venice proper itself um, in the Giardini uh, gardens. And uh, the Canadian pavilion, as many other countries have, their existing pavilion was designed somewhere in the... Uh, 50s or 60s, and it's an Italian interpretation of a tipi on a Venice island. So that's sort of, that's what we are working with, and it's a very specific context which mm -hmm. which we're going to be fitting into. Right. The uh, I think that the nature of the project, even before we get to this slide, uh, oh. there's several things that we wanted to to do to do. One of them is 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 to that's try coming. to bring Venice. Is it? Yeah, it's coming. Okay, it's coming. Sorry. One of the main aspects of the project was was uh, was trying to explore um, what our cultural, if you wish, um, uh, heritage, um, what influence our cultural heritage has on the way we design as as, as designers or, as, or architects. In, in and I guess Canada. it began from the fact that uh, Sasha, myself, and Jay were all first generation immigrants to Canada, and this was our starting point, the connection between the three of us, and we just started discussing the experiences that we've had coming to Canada, and while they were quite varied from one another, we all had them, and that was something that uh, brought us together. And then we started wondering uh, that isn't it isn't it a very Canadian condition? that we all have different backgrounds that, that are quite, uh, quite sort of unique in the context of the world, um, that we're not a homogenous culture. Uh, we have all of these different influences. We have people who are coming from all around the world and, and making uh, the mosaic of our, our Canadian culture. Great. So the, uh, I think what project is trying to do, um, aside from trying to create a create a uh, presence in, in, in Venice, to try to try to speak to the design and architectural community um, throughout the country, uh, and, and we've accomplished that through um, through connecting ourselves and our project with the with the. Um, with the people all across the country, and exhibiting the work that was solicited through a, through a public competition um, in seven cities across the country, um, in um, seven different regions, and the um, uh, culminating, if you wish, in a, in a, in a national exhibit in uh, in Winnipeg. So the uh, the seven um, seven exhibitions are showing work of, uh, of young designers uh, throughout the um, throughout the Canada. They're being juried in each one of the regions and then sent to the national uh, national exhibition in. Um, and we felt in this, this would meet the two objectives. One would be that the Biennale uh, effort itself would be much better known in Canada as a, as a result, and not only that, but they would give an opportunity to young Canadians under. Four 45 was the cutoff point for us to exhibit their work uh, not only regionally but nationally and, and internationally eventually. Um, we made the cutoff point for the 45 so that uh, we would have this, this projection of the, of the future and interesting enough the way it's worked out is that then the more established uh, generation of, of practicing architects and, and academics and, and so forth out there are then acting either as jurors or, or as sponsors of the project and really uh, it's become a really uh, Canadian effort, uh, collaborative, um, and... Uh yeah, I, I think the entire community has come Which, together yeah. through, through a number of different means in order to, um, to, uh, to make it possible. So, so the in each city then, or each region, we've collected the uh, schools of architecture, the architectural associations, and the venue itself that hosting the exhibition together under a local coordinator that's, uh, that's been, in this case, a U of M grad that we, we know personally, and that's allowed us to manage this rather logistically uh, cumbersome project. Right. So the, uh, let's talk a bit about the project itself. I think that's the. Uh, so you understand. Okay. I think you understand what the um, organizational thing is. Um, we started off from um, from sort of the idea of creating a, a landscape onto which the uh, participants will. Um, 
or project their ideas about uh, what we call first dwelling. So the, the idea or notion of the exhibition was about the first dwelling or, or place or way to settle on the, on the land. So we've, um, as a vehicle for the exhibition, we've decided to develop a landscape that will allow the competitors to, um, to settle on it. So we've developed, in essence, a system. And the, uh, there's a particular reason that system was important, which was um, as, we, as we've studied the uh, Canadian condition when it comes to uh, diversity and multiculturalism, we've discovered that it was actually about celebration of differences, much more so than uh, acceptance of tolerance, which we're seeing everywhere else around the world. So in, in such a context, uh, it, was, it became clear to us that anybody who comes to Canada is actually encouraged, if you wish, or, or expected to modify the landscape and make it richer and better for us. So therefore, the landscape became this very simple um, a modular system that allowed each individual entrant who was given a certain area of the landscape to, to modify it and settle, settle upon it. So you can see some of the inspirational images that we provided initially just to demonstrate how the landscape can be uh, Yeah, but it's also important to note that it was not only the physical landscape that we felt that one is able to modify, but, but definitely their social and cultural context. Um, um, as you revive, you're not asked to, to assimilate to a culture, but you can actually have an impact on it. So each one of the competitors is asked to do two things. One of them is to, to submit a short three-minute video uh, outlining what their cultural um, position is or, or heritage is, and then, the, uh, then respond to that with an with a architectural model uh, at their desired scale uh, that fits or lands or settles onto the landscape as, uh, as, as we provided it. So the, um, this image is from the BC opening. This was the first exhibition that opened in November. Uh, this one is from, uh, from Calgary. Um, that opened in December, and we just last week opened three shows in, in Halifax, uh, Montreal, and uh, Saskatoon. Saskatoon. And it, it just demonstrated, the project just demonstrated, without getting any deeper, please visit migratinglandscapes.ca to see what's going on, but it uh, demonstrated a, a certain level, a great level of hunger, I think, amongst uh, young designers um, to express themselves, to express themselves through the uh, through means of design, to express themselves through means of exhibition, and try to reach out and, and, and um, propagate uh, what we do to the general public. So here you can see sort of a mosaic of images of some of the entries that were submitted uh, through the competition. We've, uh, we've received 120 entries. They're slowly being pared down through regional juries, and uh, we think we're going to have about 30 of them exhibited in Winnipeg at the, uh, the national show. And the uh, national, the final jury, there's regional juries as well, but the final jury consists of um, uh, Bruce Grubawar from KPMB, um, um, John Patko, Patko Architects, uh, Eleanor Bond, um, artist, uh, some of you might know, uh, Ian Chodakov, the editor-in-chief of uh, Canadian Architect, and uh, Anne Cormier of um, in Atelier Big City. Atelier Big City, right? I was going to say in situ, but that's uh, the <laughs> Okay. Um, and then just last week, we, we found out that uh, David Chipperfield, who has been appointed uh, chief curator of the, of the Biennale this year, um, came up with the theme of common ground. And of course, the way that he talks about this theme is very appropriate, and we're very fortunate uh, that we don't have to... It's appropriate? To our topic? Yes, it's appropriate to our topic, so very, very fortunate. Um, and, and I guess the last thing that we really want to uh, say, which is it's, it's fairly mundane, but is the fact that it's a huge effort by so many people in the country. Um, the amount of money that one as an organizer gets doesn't come near to the, the amount that one has to generate uh, through a fundraising effort that, that, that we've been embarking on now uh, or been running with for, for eight months. And these are some of the sponsors that are out there. We're about 75% done, our cash, cash um, uh, total, and any sort of donations and, and support that you or any one of your friends or acquaintances. Just leave it on the stage you know, here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's a bunch of people that are Brigitte's friends here, uh, and uh, she's encouraged to ask you for money, but we're not. <laughs> so uh, we're asking you for cash. Uh, it, it's going to be used for, for a good purpose. No, but really what I want to say is uh, that the way that, uh, as we We've talked to people. This has been a huge richness. We've talked to people. We've been forced to talk to people about the project and, and pair its essence down. Um, that what's happened is that all of those people who have supported the project, all of the authors who, who have the chance to exhibit, have enriched and, and made, the, made our understanding of the project much richer. And I think this is sort of descriptive of the way and the nature of the, of the Canadian um, design culture. Design culture that we're very, very proud to be part of. So thank you.
Thank you. Would you mind taking maybe one or two questions from the audience? Um, we have two microphones on each side, and if anyone has to leave, uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, Architecture Canada has organized, um, invites everyone in the audience uh, to go to the Hearts and Crown at the end of the lecture at 67 Clarence Street for a reception that's um, meant to fundraise for the Migrating Landscape Project. And if you want to speak with uh, Sasha and Joanna, there will be an opportunity to do so informally. So if there is any question from the audience, maybe while they're thinking, <laughs> uh, I can uh, just say something. Sure. Well, I really enjoy with your housing projects, I guess how you really demonstrate that it's possible to combine economy and sustainability with character and really you know, providing identity to each unit. So that's really, I guess, wonderful. And I like it the, also how you're working with the, you know, with the migrating landscape. It feels almost like this whole, the Canadian, um, I guess, multiculturalism become, becomes a microcosm of the macrocosm of the Biennale, mm -hmm. the same, you know, just like the, all the pavilions there represent all the different countries. And uh, I wanted to ask you, now that you've seen, I guess, the first round of selections, what's uh, your feeling in terms of what's emerging from the Canadian landscape in a broad sense? Try that? Yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> well, it's sort of, well, one interesting thing is we're not able to draw many, many lines yet, or many lines to connect the, uh, to connect the dots. Uh, one interesting thing about it is, and this, this comes out of some of the commentaries uh, from, from the entrance uh, themselves, is that the, uh, this is the first time they were sort of asked to reflect upon who, you are, who they are in a design problem. So that, that became actually a very unique experience for each one of them. And with, with, uh, uh, with, with great success, they're able to sort of demonstrate that through the projects. And one, I think we talked about this um, this afternoon. One of the most um, sort of telling or interesting things is that the, the models or the designs, as they're emerging through the, through the process, um, are completely devoid of, of um, seductive imagery that we are all used to uh, these days by uh, flipping through the magazines and so on. And they seem to be digging somewhere else altogether. So there's very few, if, if any, projects that, that are they are in a way designed to capture. They're always designed to reflect, it seems to us. And, and then at, at that level, they, they become honest on a certain level. I'm not sure if this is a quest for trying to find something something else or some, some other kind of uh, meaning in, in, in architecture, but it definitely has, uh, has caused a very interesting production uh, that we weren't anticipating. So it actually has gone uh, quite, quite um, quite unexpected in a way that it created responses that are deeply meaningful and, and uh, w w without being iconic, I guess, in a way that uh, we actually expect that usually con competitions to turn in. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that, I guess, to, to us, it, it would be important um, for our young practice to figure out who you really are and what we're trying to say on a very, um, very basic level. And I think similarly, once you pause and try to think about how your, how your own makeup, whether it's through the schooling that you've had or the background that you've had, how that becomes uh, or starts to shape the way that you understand architecture, understand cities, understand context, um, it, it's worthwhile taking that pause because I think that once you figure that out and it really sort of starts to become from or starts to be uh, from within, then you're much more able to participate in that common discussion about what architecture in Canada should be. I think there's a question. Uh one last. Uh, I was curious in terms of uh, how um, you mentioned that um, also that you're recording some of the critics' comments and responses to the project. So when the exhibit will happen, you'll, you'll exhibit uh, the work uh, of, I guess, the, the participants, their videos. Will there be also some of the responses of the critics in the exhibit itself? You know, kind of like a commentary on the work? Mm -hmm. or? Uh, 
um, I guess it hasn't been fully decided yet uh, what the final makeup of the of the show will be, but it, definitely we can say that it's evolving from the regional levels to the national level and then hopefully to the international level. And I think, as, as we said, all of those commentaries that we are getting back from, from people much smarter than we are um, are starting to build, uh, build our knowledge about it and hopefully we can weave those in, if not, um, not written out as, as part of the way that the, the final exhibition is curated. Well, while in Canada, the project sort of catalogs, if you wish, the, the ideas of, of designers designing in a multicultural society and for a multicultural society. Um, I think when it goes to Venice, um, it becomes, it's going to be in an entirely different context and the project, the way it presents itself will have to change. Um, to change the, not only the means, but the, uh, the, the nature of the message. So uh, as we go somewhere else outside of the, um, outside of Canada, we, we are dealing with entirely different environments. And, you know, we leave it in your uh, capable heads to think about what that could be. But the, uh, the idea of multi exporting multiculturalism and diversity is one of the front and central ideas for the project. Well, thank you very much for a thank wonderful you. lecture, and we hope to see many of you at the Arts and Crown. Thank you. Thank you.